Hey guys, so this is gonna be a little awkward. Why? Because two years ago, my Dutch friend Vincent, who used to do the animations before I regrettably hired Ken. Wait, what? He came and visited here in LA. Long story short, I promised him he could be in the Netherlands episode. So we pre-shot some footage and this was the intro we made. I flew over this guy, a real Dutchman, say hi to Vincent right here. Hey Vincent, hey, look. Vincent, I know the Dutch are tall, but just step down from the box, okay? Just step down. Well, you get off of your box then. Good for me. I can never top those days. Oh, and this episode is on the Netherlands. It's time to learn geography. Now! Hey everybody, I'm your host Barbs. Now, there are many countries that deal with water issues. Some lack water, some have too much water, and some like the Netherlands have bridled the wild stallion and have learned how to control the water and use it to their advantage. Water is probably the most powerful element in the Netherlands, and without it, they would be, I don't know, pretty useless. So what do you say, 2016 Vincent? And now, politieke geography. So yeah, stop calling this place Holland. That's just one part of the country. Even though their country's national tourism website is called holland.com. You're not helping us here, Dutchies. Oh, and hey, there's a town called The Hulk. First of all, the country is located in Northwestern Europe along the North Sea bordered by Germany and Belgium. The country is divided into 12 provinces. Here's 2016 Vincent naming all of them for you. They are Limburg, Noord-Holland, Zeiland, Zuid-Holland, Utrecht, Gelderland, Overijssel, Drenthe, Groningen, Friesland, Noord-Holland, and the newest province, Flevoland. Almost all of Flevoland was reclaimed from the Zuiderzee in the 19th so besides being famous for making cheese and clogs, we also make our own land. The country kind of has two capitals, Amsterdam, the largest city and economic hub of the country, and home to the Royal Palace. And just to skip over, the third largest city, The Hague, acts as the second capital, which holds the seat of government, as well as the International Court of Justice. The second largest city, though, would be Rotterdam, which holds the busiest seaport in all of Europe. The busiest airport, though, is, of course, Amsterdam's Schiphol International, Europe's third busiest airport, carrying nearly 70 million passengers annually. Now we reach the overseas territories. Apart from the mainland European part, the country actually holds sovereign over six other island entities in the Caribbean, remnants of the colonial past. These are collectively called the Dutch Caribbean. And here's where it gets a little confusing. Technically, the Netherlands is a country made up of four countries, the mainland Netherlands, as well as three other constituent countries, kind of like what Wales and Scotland are to the UK. They are Aruba, Curaçao, and St. Martin, which is actually half of an island shared with the French overseas territory of the same name, but in French. This means that this one island is the only area which the Netherlands technically borders France. These guys hold a high level of autonomy, they can have their own constitutions and currency. Otherwise, the remaining three islands are Bonaire, St. Eustatius, and Little Saba, which by the way has the shortest airport runway in the world. These three fall under the title of special municipalities and do not belong to any province. They are directly controlled by the Dutch government. However, in 2011, they decided to switch currencies and adopt the US dollar. All these islands lie in the subregion known as the Lesser Antilles. Aruba, Curaçao, and Bonaire are usually referred to as the ABC islands, lying in the subregion of the Leeward Antilles, whereas St. Eustatius Eustatius, Saba, and St. Martin, usually called the SSS Islands, are located in the subregion of the Leeward Islands. Keep in mind, at one point, all six of these islands were called the Netherlands Antilles and operated collectively as a single constituent country with the capital at Willemstad and Curaçao. They even competed separately in the Olympics. With the exception of Aruba, who had autonomy in 1986, it wasn't until the early 2000s when they all voted for their future, and it kind of went like this. Okay guys, you have four options for your future. Choose wisely. You can have closer ties to us, remain just as you are in the Netherlands Antilles, autonomy as a constituent country within the Kingdom of the Netherlands, or you can opt for complete independence as a new nation and break away from us. We vote for autonomy as constituent countries. Me too. What the? We want closure ties and we'll settle for special municipality status. Really, Bonaire? You're one of us, the ABC Island. You're really gonna ditch us like that and leave us with this half Frenchy magoo? Yep, deal with it. And that's basically how it went down. So there you go, that's how you make a Netherlands. Waterways dominate the country though. There's even a town with no roads and only canals. But how did it end up this way? Somewhere around the ninth century, people were kind of fed up with all the flooding and they invented these seawalls known as dikes, which surrounded polders or reclaimed land plots protected by the dikes. To to this day, the Netherlands has reclaimed about a fifth of its total landmass from the sea. So what would happen if all the dikes were destroyed and all the water just came and flooded everything? Scientists speculate that the country would go from looking like this to this. Whoa, Amsterdam would be gone. Yep. Luckily, the Dutch are fantastic engineers and have been taming this dragon for centuries. And speaking of engineering, there are so many notable spots to check out in case you ever visit. So many museums, but the most notable one probably being the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam, the Royal Palace, the Van Gogh 
Museum, the Anne Frank House, numerous castles like these, numerous star-shaped fortress towns, so many amusement parks like these, the enclaves and exclaves of Beryl Nassau, we talked about this in the Belgium episode, the world's largest flower garden at Kuchenhof, Austerlitz Pyramid, this prehistoric burial site, and of course there are somewhere around 1,000 historic windmills left in the country from the 1800s, mostly in the Kinderdijk area, a UNESCO heritage site. Keep in mind though, the country has a ton of modern wind turbines that help supply energy to the nation, a topic that will be discussed in... Greek philosopher Pythias visited in the 3rd century BC, and he said about this place, more people have died in the struggle against water than in the struggle against men. The Netherlands is really unlike any other country in Europe because in order for them to even have physical land, a lot of work has to go into it. For one, the country is the lowest country in Europe, elevation-wise. Over a quarter of the land and a fifth of the population lies below sea level, and about half of the land lies less than a meter above sea level. The lowest point actually being here at Polder, and the highest point of the mainland European part of the country at a small hill called Falseberg, just over a thousand feet or 322 meters high. However, in the entire kingdom of the Netherlands, the highest point would actually be Mount Scenery, a potentially active volcano on the island of Saba in the Caribbean. Back to mainland Europe though, within this complex system of waterways and canals, the famous Rhine River that goes through all of Europe and the longest in the country actually ends in Rotterdam. The largest body of water would be Lake or Bay Yelsemir, contained within the N302 and E22 highways. In order to manage all the flooding in the south though, the Netherlands has undergone one of the largest engineering engineering projects in modern history. The Delta Works is a series of massive elevated levees that close off sea estuaries, preventing flooding. They even have backup levees in case one down the line bursts. In the north though, the Walden Islands act as kind of like natural barriers against the sea. All this land reclamation has left many of the inland areas exposed to what are labeled as the largest open sand drifts in Europe. Keep in mind, they are not deserts, but rather strange wet sandy plots in the middle of green shrubbery, a rare natural sight to come across anywhere in the world. So in a nutshell, the entire country is basically one big River Delta. Hmm. We should hang out sometime. Whew. So that's just about it for now. I gotta get my triple shot of espresso break, which means we need a guy who knows a few things. <laughs> Besides all the water chaos, the Netherlands is quite a powerful nation considering its size. They rank in the top 20 largest world economies, usually around 17th or 16th place, and they rank somewhere in the top 5 to 10 largest exporters on Earth. In fact, they have the oldest stock exchange in the world, dating back to 1602. Didn't that lead to like the whole tulip mania thing where people sold a single bulb for the price of like an entire ship? That was not the stock market, that was just a socioeconomic phenomenon and at its height sold for 10 times the annual wage of a skilled craftsman. Anyway, today, although they produce about 80% of the world's tulips and over half of the world's cut flower exports, their economy is mostly driven by the service and energy sectors. After the discovery of a natural gas field in 1959, the Dutch became a fuel powerhouse. The Shell Company became the largest and most internationally recognized Dutch company in the world. Besides the petroleum industry though, the Dutch are well known for their electronics and tech innovation. The company Philips invented the audio tape, which helped pioneer other formats like videotapes, CDs, DVDs, and Blu-rays. Yeah, the company was Dutch, but keep in mind it was invented in Hassel, Belgium. Oh, Belgium. We love you, but don't try to f***ing take this from us. Otherwise, the Dutch have made great strides towards environmental protection. It's not uncommon to find animal crossing bridges to allow wildlife to cross over highways. Over 70 mammal species exist here, such as hares, hedgehogs, stoats, and deer. In addition, according to their government website, they produce over 65 billion euros in vegetable, fruit, flour, meat, and dairy products. Speaking of which, the modern orange colored carrot was originally bred orange here in the Netherlands to specifically honor the king. Since then, orange carrots are now kind of an international staple. And speaking of which food. Some top notable dishes you guys, the Dutch geography peeps, suggested we mentioned include things like various types of stamp pots, Dutch pancakes with powdered sugar, apple tarts, bitter ballen, split pea soup, rookwurst, stroop waffles, so many potato dishes, brined herring, and smoked eel. Gin was invented here, sorry Brits. For breakfast, chocolate sprinkles on toast is common. And the pride and joy of the nation, how to cheese. Yep. That's how you pronounce it, guys. Oh, and keep in mind, they used to be the largest beer exporters in the world, Heineken being their top brand until Mexico beat them in 2010. Oh, wow, cool. It's also important to note that you will probably find lots of Indonesian and Surinamese dishes like satay or salted cod buns, a little cultural cue that hints towards the colonial past, which brings us to... Thank you, Noah. Follow him on Instagram. Yep. That just happened. Now in Europe, you have all different types of people that operate with all different customs and ideologies. Here they have two sayings that kind of sum up how a lot of their country operates. Meten is weten and geselligheid kent geen tijd. How is that Dutchies? Terrible? Good? 
Well, you're gonna get what I give. Anyway, the country has about 17.5 million people and is the most densely populated nation in Europe. About 77% of the population identifies as Dutch, to whatever extent that may mean, whereas 10% are other Europeans, and the remainder are made up of other people groups, mostly Turks, Indonesians, as well as the Surinamese, and surprisingly, even some Americans. They use the Euro as their currency, they use the Type C and F plug outlets, and they drive on the right side of the road. Now, we all know that Dutch is the official language of the Netherlands, however, if you speak English, you should have no problem at all visiting. Netherlands has the highest proficiency in English out of any non-English official country in the world. Somewhere around 9 out of 10 Dutch people claim they can comfortably speak English, and around 94% of the country is in some way bilingual. Geographeep Anna told me a joke. Many times, Dutch kids will ask their parents, Hey mom. Yes, honey. Why do we have to learn English, but the British don't have to learn Dutch? Because our ancestors decided it would be a great idea to trade New York for Suriname and one small island in Indonesia. It's important to note, though, that there are two other regional languages accepted in Dutch society. They are Frisian, spoken in the northern Friesland region, and the other being Papimiento, a Dutch Creole spoken in the ABC Islands. But it's already kind of well known that the Dutch are the tallest people on average in the world, men averaging around 6 foot 1 and women around 5 foot 7. And once again, here's 2016 Vincent explaining. Latest studies have shown that natural selection has been the biggest reason. Being tall equal to being more athletic, successful, and healthy. Many educated men start families after their studies. Fast forward a couple of years, with length being very heritable, and the result is a nation of giants. Yeah, we're outbreeding short people. Mm. Religion in the Netherlands is interesting because historically, they used to be predominantly Christian, mostly Protestant, but today about half the population identifies as unaffiliated, which depending on who you ask could be anything from the largest unaffiliated group, agnostics, at about 34%, to the growing number of eatists at around 28%, which is kind of like a technical term for spiritual but not religious. Otherwise, Islam at about 5% of the population is mostly practiced by Turkish and Indonesian communities. Christianity, although not practiced regularly by most of the people, still plays a heavy cultural role in the Netherlands. Holidays like Christmas, Easter, Pentecost, and Ascension are still celebrated by everyone in a Dutch manner. At one point, they were a vast empire that spanned across every inhabited continent. Australia was at one point called New Holland, New Zealand, named after the Zeeland province, Tasmania, named after this Dutch guy, New York was once called New Amsterdam, and so on. Otherwise, what is the Dutch way of doing things. Many of you guys, the Dutch geography have told me, there's a Dutch saying, act normal, which is ironic considering that they are almost anything but normal. And here's random Hannah to explain culture stuff. Historically, the Dutch have always kind of had a counter-traditional mindset that shaped the way they developed as a nation. For one, they are one of the few remaining monarchies left in the world, technically a unitary parliamentary constitutional monarchy that limits the royal powers. And the people generally like their king. He even has a holiday to himself, and the entire country wears the national color of orange. Of course, the country is known for being a frontrunner in passing what many in the world see as controversial laws. They were the first country to legalize same-sex marriage, they have regulated legal prostitution, euthanasia, and they have a policy of tolerance toward recreational soft drugs like marijuana. People 18 years or older are allowed up to 5 grams on them, otherwise it's a misdemeanor. They are world renowned for excelling in field hockey, speed skating, and volleyball teams. Sailing is of course one of their longest pastimes. They even have a huge festival once every five years called the Sailed Amsterdam Festival. For some reason, it's common for people to give birth in their own homes as opposed to a hospital. About one third of all babies are born this way. Uh, what about those clogged things? Ah, yes. Well, in the past, they actually served a very useful purpose. They were worn by farmers, fishermen, and artisans in the past to protect their feet from nails, fish hooks, and other other sharp objects. Today they are mostly sold as souvenirs and very few people actually wear them, but they're pretty cool. Oh and hey Anna, what's up with all those spinny windmill thingy mabobbers? Ah yes, the iconic symbol of the Netherlands. Well many of these historic windmills were actually used to pump out excess water to reclaim the land that they now use for farming, all before electricity. And as for music, the- Actually, I got this one. Barb said I could have my own segment in the show now instead of just being a one-liner guy! Yeah that's right, uh, Keith has been upgraded. So, yeah. Well, well, enjoy it. Well, that just happened. Again, I guess everybody has superpowers now. Historically speaking, the Dutch contributed much to the Baroque period at the end of the Renaissance, with numerous composers, organ players, and vocalists rooted in Christianity. Traditional clog dancing was also a cool way to add percussion to folk music in rural areas. Today, however, even though there are many genres the Dutch enjoy, electronic music reigns supreme. Most of the best well-known DJs in the EDM scene across the world are from the Netherlands. And the Amsterdam Dance Event, ADE, is 
is the world's top and largest electronic music conference. So if you come out here, get ready to get shocked with some musical electricity. Thank you, Keith. And speaking of the development of the Netherlands over time, let's talk about history in the quickest way I can put it. Hamburg and Bronze Age cultures, Iron Age with Celt and Germanic groups, Gallic Wars, the Romans come in, Frankish kingdoms, Charlemagne, blah, blah, blah. Friesland once had a Viking ruler, Lotharingia, Holy Roman Empire, confusing Burgundian and Spanish Habsburg and city-states, the Spanish takeover, Dutch revolt, 80 years of war against Spain, this dude is a hero, Golden Age and stock market, Dutch East India Company, exploring years, Dutch Empire, Napoleon drama, Belgium breaks away, Luxembourg breaks away, World War I, relatively neutral, World War II, attacked by Germans, not neutral, decolonialism after the war, mining golden age, founding co-members of the European coal and steel community, which would later become the EU, government encourages over half a million people to move out, Euro adopted, and here we are today. Some notable people you guys, the Dutch geography people suggest we mention, might include people like William of Orange, the first king, Michael de Reuter, possibly the most famous painters, Vincent van Gogh and Rembrandt, Anthony van Llewellenhoek, Willem Berendt, Abel Taz, Anne Frank, Max Verstappen, Glennis Grace, Dick Bruna, these soccer players, these skaters, and of course the royal family. And of course there's so many others I could have mentioned. Of course I butchered all the pronunciations, but we're really running out of time and we gotta finish this marathon. So without further ado, let's see who the Netherlands hangs out with. Now, there's a reason why it's called going Dutch when paying for a meal. The Netherlands likes to share. Systematic and mathematically equivalent to what is owed to each based on the merit they've earned. First of all, pretty much all the former colonies have some kind of amicable relation to the Netherlands. The Afrikaans language in South Africa is basically just an Africanized version of Dutch. Tons of Surinamese and Indonesians have been migrating to the Netherlands for decades. Otherwise, the USA and Canada are very close friends as well. During World War II, the royal family actually took refuge in Canada, and Canada actually quickly changed the law in which the hospital was temporarily considered extra territorial so that the princess could be born Dutch. To this day, the Netherlands sends tons of flowers every year in gratitude. For the US, the two go way back all the way to New Amsterdam before it was New York. The Dutch have immigrated to the US for centuries. Five American presidents have been of Dutch descent. They are each other's third largest direct foreign investors. They are both charter members of NATO since 1949. And overall, in most global affairs, the two usually work together as close allies. With Germany, it's like a funny love-hate relationship. Like the two share so much historically, both being under the same influence influences like the Western Roman Empire, the Franks, and even their first king, William of Orange, belonged to a German royal house. Then again, World War II was kind of like a jerk move, and the Dutch never really forgot about it. But nonetheless, they've moved on, and today things are fine. Germany is their largest trading partner, both in imports and exports. Many Germans and Dutch cross over and visit, study, live, and have families with each other's countries. When it comes to their best friend, however, almost every single Dutch person I have talked to has said their little brother they love picking fun on and calling stupid, Belgium. Or at least specifically the Northern Flanders region of Belgium where the Dutch speakers are. And many see the Flanders region as just an extension of the Dutch realm. The royal families love each other. King William Alexander even bestowed the Knight Grand Cross to King Philip and his wife. Flemish and Dutch people have been intermarrying and cooperating side by side since the beginning. And even after Belgium's independence, they've still clung on as the only two Dutch official speaking nations in Europe. And even then, Belgium is only half Dutch speaking, so they really can't afford to sever ties. In conclusion, the lowest nation in Europe with the tallest people on earth and with centuries of discovery, invention, innovation, and tradition, it's no wonder why the Dutch say they keep their heads above water. Stay tuned, New Zealand is coming up next. So once again, Vincent, thank you so much for being in this episode. Our favorite Dutchman, you have made your country proud. Dutch Buzz! <laughs>